Let's see. Everybody hear me okay? Let's see. If I drop this down, you can't hear me anymore. And now you can hear me again. Okay. If I s sort of go out of mic range, somebody like, I don't know, wave your arms. And can you hear me now? Oh, yes, you can hear me. Okay. I can do this. Hello. Good morning, and thanks to Andrew for that awesome introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming out in the, uh, the windy and rainy weather as well. It's good to have you here. Yeah. It's actually the same weather as we have back in California, so it's very thoughtful of you to provide homey weather for us. Makes us feel very comfortable. So my name's Kat Allman. I've worked with Google. I have a background in open source software going back about 20 years, maybe a little more. But uh, only at Google have I gotten to do things like come and talk with people like you about things like this. So thank you for having me. And my name is Leslie Hawthorne, and I'm also a program manager in Google's open source programs office. And I mostly focus on our outreach programs to students both at the university and pre-university level. So we're here to talk to you today about getting started in free and open source software. The idea being that where do you start? It uh, can be a little intimidating to face an internet full of people who seem to know more than you do. So we're here to help you get over that hurdle. So before we get started, just the few standard disclaimers. Um, these are our opinions. They are not the opinions of any past, present, or future employer. Uh, so if you uh, have any moments of praise or perhaps rotten tomatoes, they should all be directed towards us. And these are purely based on our experiences, so your experiences might be quite different, in which case, please let us know so that we can improve this talk. So, bottom line, to begin at the beginning or the end or something, one of those things, why would you want to get involved with an open source project? People come to a free and open source software from a variety of motivations, all of which are perfectly valid, such as? Gaining new skills. So you may be a programmer who wants to learn a new language. Uh, you may be a person who has done some technical writing or some writing in your spare time or as your career, and you'd like to branch out and work on something new and exciting. You may be a graphic artist who's looking for a way to enhance your portfolio. Um, and there are a whole host of other opportunities in free and open source software that are available to you. And this is a great place to get new skills and sharpen your existing ones. And frankly, the professional networking, um, contrary to the popular belief that free and open source software is something that people do at night in their basement when they should be sleeping, um, lots of people besides Leslie and myself have gainful employment doing free and open source software. Plus, we get to know all kinds of interesting people from all over the world. So there's uh, professional networking opportunities, as they say. And then there's the personal gratification. It's just, actually, it's just really fun to work with this community. It's a great group of folks with a bunch of uh, eclectic interests. And you get to go to great talks where you get to hear about science uh, from people like Paul Fenwick. Um, if you missed that talk, I'm very sorry. You should ask him about the uh, little beads for children. He'll know what we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, it's also a great opportunity for you to be able to share your value system. Um, a lot of people get involved in free and open source software because they're excited about the concept of freedom of speech and empowering other people. And there is nothing quite as awesome as being involved in a group that's really about helping you be better and be able to accomplish more using the tools that you use every day. And to take it a little higher out there, um, I love this slide not only because it's very attractive, but it, because it illustrates very early technology. Once upon a time, the power of the press belonged only to those people who owned a press. Open source gives us the opportunity as individuals and as groups to control, well, really not just control, but create the technologies, the communication avenues, forms of self-expression for ourselves. Um, not to date myself, but it's very punk rock if you've ever wanted to be in a band and you don't know how to play an instrument, no problem, learn how to play an instrument. Uh, there's tremendous opportunities for self-expression that have real repercussions in the greater world in terms of people taking control of their own destiny. So I would urge you to both have fun on the 
micro level, but also on the macro level. So where to get started? If you have never participated in a free and open source software project, you may walk in and realize that you are surrounded by very, very smart people. And you may think that everybody in this project is this guy right here. Does everyone recognize this photo? We had a, a heckler the other day who, did, who claimed to not realize this was in fact Albert Einstein. Excellent, none of those today. So, you know, it is, it is very easy to be intimidated because of the wealth of knowledge that's already there when you're coming into a project and you haven't had any experience. I like to ask the audience, you know, if you found yourself on an airplane or a bus sitting next to this gentleman, would you argue the theory of relativity with him? And inevitably, let's see, who's going to stand up and say, yeah, I would? Yeah, yeah I knew it was going to be Julian. <laughs> We gave this talk at a BSD conference in Ottawa, and this guy said, well, I would because he was my tutor at Cambridge, and I'm used to doing that. And it's like, fine, okay, anybody else? <laughs> but the truth is, people who are just getting started look at the people who are already involved, and there's a big intimidation factor. But... <clears throat> Believe it or not, uh, not everyone involved in uh, open source software is Einstein, and in fact, not everyone involved in open source software is a prolific coder. We don't really write code. Shown here actual size, people who make an impact in open source every day without writing the software. Yes. This could be you if you would like it to be. So what can you do in addition to the hardcore creating the kernel, blah, blah, blah? There's lots of ways to contribute to open source that are not strictly about the hardcore coding. Which one would you like me to discuss? Um, let's talk about localization. All right, so localization. So localization is the concept that you will take um, the user interface or actual software and make sure that it's available to someone in their language. So, and also this is, involves the translating of documentation. So. It's, uh, it's pretty normal and common for us to think of the lingua franca or official language of computer science and computing as being English. And that has been the tradition you know, since computing really began. And yet, while that's useful and effective for those of us for whom English is the first language, that really doesn't help those of us who, for whom that is not the case. So if you happen to know another language, a really great way that you can get involved in a particular project is translate their documentation. If you know French, if you know Thai, if you know et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Make that software and those tools available to even more people because it's now accessible to them in their first language. An example of this is Leslie runs a program called Google Summer of Code for university students. And in the beginning of the program where we're getting the word out to students to please apply, we send out a flyer, or actually we post it on the internet. And what did we have, 70, 60 75. translations of all different kinds of languages. So we get students from all over the world, um, 90 countries I think so far, participating in this program with the help of other people who want to lend yeah. an hour or two of expertise. It's really wonderful and it makes a big impact. One other point that I'd like to make uh, too about documentation. Um, those of you in the audience who like to write or at least like to make sure that other people can understand what is going on, even if writing is not your forte, uh, documentation is actually a really great way to get started in projects because as a newcomer, you know the like, gaping holes in the project's knowledge base. You know what question you had to ask over and over again. You know what you tried really, really hard to find and just couldn't find an answer and finally had to go and you know, poke somebody and say, hey, how do I do this, that, and the other. So if you're coming along and you're new to a project and you actually want to write a whole lot of documentation about how to get things done, that's great. If not, a really great, quick, upfront contribution, if you ask a question and you get a good answer, write it up and then ask some of the project folks if they can include it in their frequently asked questions page. And then that is some documentation that they don't have to write. And as you get more involved in free and open source software, you'll realize that perhaps coders really hate to write documentation. Oh, yeah. And they will love you because they didn't have to. A very good thing. Can I, can I just add? I'd I like to add a comment in here because, uh, yeah, um, for those who don't know me, I'm Graham Lauder, I'm marketing contact for openoffice.org in New Zealand. We have a very, very strong um, documentation project uh, with lots of people writing lots of excellent uh, um, um, uh, 
uh, lots of documentation for the uh, for the project, um, but there's never enough, and and the community is very very accepting of people that want to come in and develop their skills. And we're talking about we're talking about the gaining skills earlier on. Um, and if you uh, have people who want to learn about actually creating really really good technical doc documentation, we have a team of people at the top end of the uh, OOOauthors.org that will um, will. will put you right and show you how to write really, really good technical documentation and with a little bit of luck, you'll help us do ours. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Actual real opportunities, shown here, actual size. Yeah. Um, and related to that, user support. Um, everybody has questions. It's not always um, everybody's favorite thing to do to provide answers. As you get more experienced in your project, um, and experience can mean simply participating in the mailing list and watching what's going on. Answering questions is very helpful. Um, Leslie certainly deals with this a great deal on Summer of Code of even though there's an FAQ, people will sometimes um, save their time and post a message to the list. And luckily, she doesn't have to answer all these questions because other people in the community jump in and either answer the question or direct people to the appropriate part of the FAQ. Invaluable and a really great place to get started. But wait, there's more. Um, how many folks in the audience when they hear the word marketing want to throw up? <laughs> All right, a few of you. Not nearly as many as, uh, as there were uh, at some other talks. So believe it or not, marketing is actually a very valuable part of the free and open source community, even though when they hear the word marketing, they tend to think, oh, dear Lord, no. So we are here to have an intervention and let folks know that it is actually very important to do marketing. People are not going to know what great stuff you have to offer unless you tell them about it. Yeah. It really is, you know, don't think of it as being a weasel. Think of it as providing friends you haven't met yet the opportunity to know about something that they're interested in. And I'm getting a big thumbs up from the back, which is making That's my good. morning, I got to tell you. Um, marketing takes many forms. Um, we have social media as its own uh, segment because it has become so terribly important. And I defer to my colleague on the subject of social media. She's very good at it. Uh, uh, so how many of you folks live on Twitter? Okay. How many of you have heard of Identica? Oh, that's even better. I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, if you do get up on the Facebook, okay, a few people get up on the Facebook. So you may not realize just how many people that you know and love are actually watching everything you write to these various social media services that you don't think are, you know, you think no one's actually watching except maybe your mom and your dog. And it's actually a very useful way to do outreach because if you say something that's interesting, people can simply amplify your message very easily using these tools. And if you're the kind of person who's really, really good at crafting a message, for example, come to this awesome event on Sunday. It's open day. You can learn all about computing for free. Take the time to be the one who spreads that message. There are a lot of folks in the community who really could just do without Twitter entirely. Maybe you could be the person who shields them from the Twitter sphere. And it's a valuable thing to do. A personal favorite of mine, and I think I'm going to get another thumbs up from the back of the room, is event organizing. As much as we all tend to live online, there's nothing quite like getting together face to face and getting to know the people that you think you know, but do you ever really know someone until you've had a beer with them or at least some sort of meal? And getting the community together gets over big chunks of obstacles. Um, personally, I think LCA is one of the best of the best at this. So I would encourage you all, if you get enthusiastic about this topic, to uh, attend next year. But um, it takes a tremendous amount of work to put one of these on. Not everybody has the patience to deal with fire regulations, um, God, electrical contractors, finding space, negotiating hotel contracts. If you have skills in these areas, you are golden. I would urge you, if you like throwing parties, come on down. 
And if you do decide this is something you want to do, the most important rule ever is always make sure that you never run out of coffee. Very do important. Do that and you'll be fine. Yes. I'm going I'm to put in a promo. I'm going to put in a promo. Uh, OpenOffice.org conference this year, October, in Budapest. Come on, what a place You to could go. go to Hungary. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. I've been there. It's actually quite lovely. Yeah. Lovely goulash. Um, related to that fundraising, if you have the intestinal fortitude to ask strangers for money, um, projects actually do need money to support things like sending people to Budapest, for example, um, and bandwidth and storage and machines and things like that. And then there's the sort of vague and yet oh so important community manager tag. That's basically what Leslie and I do full time for Google. And, and the, the general idea there is really just helping people get good stuff done. And that takes many forms. So if you're the kind of person who likes to help other people get organized, not necessarily doing everything yourself, but just sort of pointing people in the right direction and project managing, there's a huge, huge need for that in the free and open source community. So that could be a great place for you to step up. And Sweet. And related to that, but slightly different, is release engineering, which was actually on the previous slide. It's kind of like community management, project management, but more on the code side. It's, um, is it Samba? Yeah, it's Samba project. The person who herds all the cats together to get the code ready to release and then out the door is, I believe, a, uh, a nurse in her day job, writes no code at all, the project would, I don't want to say it would crumble, but it would certainly lose little chunks off the edges without her. A very important task for the technical person, or rather the non-technical person who is perhaps less gregarious than your average event-oriented person. There's roles for everybody is the point. And if you don't believe us about this, Jeremy Allison of the Samba Project is actually in our booth at Open Day. That was an example of marketing that hopefully didn't make you throw up. And you can go and speak with him about their release engineer. Yeah. So there are things you can do, but there are also tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of free and open source projects Hi. out there. How do you pick one? We get asked this all the time. It's, um, I'd never, it never occurred to me to ask, but every year for um, Summer of Code, students from all over the world say, you know, could you pick me a project? Like, I'm not going to tell you what books to read or what food to like. Why would I tell you what project to work on? But it is a lot to choose from. So how do you choose? So the easiest way is to ask your friends. Typically, people don't come to the free and open source community knowing absolutely nothing at all. So talk to your friends about what they're working on. See if it's something that would be exciting to you. If it's not exciting to you, tell them what you're excited about and ask them for help in finding something that matches what you actually want to do. Um, social or political concerns, there's all kinds of very interesting open source projects around that. There's also the simple technical need. Um, many years ago, many years ago, um, my brother was tired of running downstairs to the wiring closet to move the wires around, which is what you had to do to send a piece of email from one network to another. So he wrote some code that enabled email to find its way from one network to another without physically moving wires around. And therein, the world of email became possible for people around the world, or at least people who weren't within running down the stairs distance of uh, sockets. I would have thought that would have been a fabulous exercise program. Yeah. It's really about what your personal need is, scratching your own itch. And uh, just before we move on really quickly, one really important point to remember is when you get started, um, you will find that there are so many interesting and amazing things to do that you're going to want to do everything. Uh, the free and open source software world is a very wide ocean, and once you get your toe stuck in, you're just going to want to jump in full force. That's cool, that's groovy, that enthusiasm is so important. It's actually what really powers this community since a lot of the work is done by volunteers. That being said, limit your scope. Focus on doing one or two things well. Uh, a lot of the time I see this happen pretty consistently. Folks come in, they're new, they're enthusiastic, they're excited, they try and take on the world. They can't take on the world 
and they walk away feeling a bit sheepish and thinking maybe this wasn't the place for them to go in the first place. When or, really it was just that they bit off a little bit more than they could chew. Or they just get completely burnt out and have to go and lie down for another year. That isn't fun either. So, now what? How, you've picked out your project, you have some idea of what you want to do, but how do you then make the leap? How do you integrate yourself into this new community of potential friends? So for those of us who are, are not already uh, ingrained in the uh, open source model, the word lurking tends to sort of have kind of a negative connotation, like what's lurking in the bushes, you know, and that, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But actually lurking is a very positive term in this case. And the idea of lurking is that you just simply sit back and observe. You may join a mailing list, but not send any messages to it. You may join an IRC channel, but not talk for a while and just see what other people are talking about. Uh, you may go to a website and check out a project's forums where people are discussing various topics, but you yourself don't say anything yet. And that actually has a tremendous amount of value in this world because it gives you the opportunity to observe what's going on, learn who the key players are, learn what some of the hot buttons are, you know, just get a sense of the personalities in the project, which is great so that when you want to get started, you're ready. Or for you to just figure out, wait a minute, I'm not sure if this is a place where I feel like hanging out. Maybe these aren't the kind of folks that I want to have a beer with. I'm going to go find the kind of people that I want to go hang out with and have lunch. Leslie mentioned a very important word, which is personality. Groups of people, just like individuals, have personalities. They have preferred styles of interaction. They have preferred methods of communication. If you're somebody who isn't comfortable on IRC and you pick a project that lives and dies on IRC, you may never get comfortable with that. Um, if you're somebody who is somewhat demure and not interested in having, shall we say, violent online arguments for the sake of arguing, and you get to the project and discover that people really like mixing it up and calling each other bad words, again... You're not going to be happy there. Not so much. Not yeah. a good place to spend your time. So it's perfectly okay to hang around a little bit and see if, even if the project is interesting, the community might not be a good fit for you. Not that they're bad people, but they're not people you want to hang out with. And just keep an eye out for things like calls for volunteers on a website or uh, on a mailing list, et cetera, any of the communication channels. Because if you're ready to get started contributing, eventually you're going to see a message float by that says, we really need someone to say staff a booth at Open Day in Wellington. If you happen to live in Wellington, you've been excited about the project. I can show up for a couple of hours and man a booth, even if I'm just schlepping boxes or maybe I'm just making sure that there are always stickers on the table, and maybe you can only answer the most basic questions. But the fact of the matter is that that is a contribution and it is an important one. So you've lurked around, you've gotten a sense of the community, how people interact with each other, you're still interested. So then what do you do? Well, as Leslie said, you volunteer to help. And uh, so this is very, very important. So bonus points for showing up, volunteering to help, and having a useful suggestion. Uh, there is, is nothing more frustrating than talking to someone who's very enthusiastic, very intelligent, who comes in and gives you a laundry list of complaints with no idea of how to fix them. Yeah. Because we're all very good, I think, at identifying problems, identifying solutions is much more difficult. Yeah. If you can actually identify a solution, you will get lots of love. You will get even more love if you not only identify a solution, but then implement that solution. Yeah. So that's really, really important. It's very easy to have good ideas. Execution, very, very important as well. Indeed. And bug reports. Speaking as a non-coder, I always think of bug reports as scary things related to deep end coding. But in fact, if you find something on the website that um, links that are broken, pages that don't scan, um, I got stuck on a website recently where there was just this sort of endless loop in the sign-up project. Filing a bug report, and there's great resources online how to do that in the most effective and helpful way, is a tremendous contribution. No coding required. And if you are feeling uh, particularly nervous or trepidatious about filing a bug report because you've never done it before and you've read through the documentation and you're still not sure, 
ask somebody to look at the bug before you file it. Nothing is appreciated more in a project than a well-written bug report that's actually actionable and doesn't simply say, does not go. Yeah. That doesn't actually help anyone fix the problem. It's anyone broken. Fix the problem <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Um, and and this, this is the problem we find in the OpenOffice.org project. OpenOffice.org is a really, really large project that has possibly, arguably, more users worldwide than any of the other Linux projects. So as a consequence, we have lots of eyes on the bugs. Now, what happens is people get a bug, they submit it into the, into the issuezilla, and invariably what happens is it gets dumped because it's a duplicate, and people get quite offended about it. Um, and we try to say to people, hey, look, don't worry about it. You've got it. There's a lot of people out there. If it gets, if the duplicate, if it gets dumped because it's a duplicate, then say, hey, look, great, this is excellent because we've got a whole pile of people out there that are casting their eyes on this software. All right? Don't be disappointed. That be like me. I use all the bleeding edge software because one day I'm going to score a real sucker of a bug that nobody else has seen, <laughs> and that's my lottery coming. And, and for those folks who are not familiar with uh, bug reporting culture or reporting problems, uh, duplicates do happen all the time. A duplicate is just someone else has already submitted this bug. So we're not going to keep a record of your bug in our tracker because then we'd have 50 of the same problem listed. And a brief side note for any of you. Oh, is everybody familiar with the term bug report? Anybody? This is the first time. Ah, Great. Okay, Thank you. That Thank enables you. me to tell this slightly amusing story. The term bug report actually comes because way back when, I think it was ENIAC, um, post-Second World War, Grace Hopper, who was an admiral, um, ended up as an admiral in the Navy, but was also one of the early computer software engineers. Um, there's a whole conference named after her. There was a problem. The machine wouldn't work, and they looked in, and they found that there was, in fact, a moth on the circuit board, which had shorted something out. And hence, the term bug report was, came to life. So, so uh, the, the quick and dirty overview. A bug report is your opportunity to go to a project. There will be usually a web form. And you can then put in uh, what went wrong. And typically, the uh, other pieces of information that folks ask for include um, what, what program were you running, what version was it, um, what, what platform were you running? Was it Windows? Was it Mac? Was it Linux? Was it BSD? There are a couple of others. Some folks are actually good enough to even give you a template to fill in. Some of those uh, questions may be intimidating at first. Again, ask for help. Projects really appreciate getting a good problem report or bug report or moth report. So, and now we come to the uh, slightly alarming, but it, it's worth it. Trust me, we're here to help. How not to get flamed. Um, is everyone familiar with the term flamed? All right, so for the, <laughs> that's good. So the idea of flaming is that perhaps you may say something uh, that you think is perfectly reasonable and other people do not, and then they the response to this is for people to say uh, unkind things about you and uh, your hamster and possibly anyone you may have ever met. Yes. And uh, it can be a less than pleasant experience. Hence the need for asbestos knickers, I think they're called Yes, here. that is correct. So, so there's a fairly historical culture of how to behave on the internet. Sometimes it's uh, unpleasant, but there's uh, some tips we can give you. Frankly, I liken it to the kind of information I wish I'd had in high school so that uh, I would have had more friends, but water under the bridge. So. It's actually fairly important to be willing to ask people for newbie documentation or to look around for it. If a project doesn't have newbie documentation, that tells you a couple of things. One, if you're incredibly dedicated, you're the perfect person to write that newbie documentation because you're new. And two, it might also be a hint that this isn't necessarily the best project for you because if they haven't gotten to that stage in their evolution, they may not be ready to take on newbies. So just something to think about. Another thing that I think is really important is to demonstrate to the community that you're trying to enter that you actually have done some work and some research. Uh, you will get an answer to a question in minutes if you say, 
I don't know how to do this or how to solve this problem, but I searched for information here. I searched the internet using these terms. I found this article, but it doesn't answer my problem. Can somebody help me? Versus, I'm having this problem, please help me fix it. The second question gets an answer in about a week when somebody has time because they think that you're, you're maybe you'll figure it out on your own in the interim. And the answer tends to be RTFM, which is an acronym for Read the Fine Manual. And it is very fine. Um, for those of you who are coders, if you're interested in a project, look at the code. There are all kinds of delicious comments in there, some of which are incredibly useful and might in fact serve as documentation. For those of us who are not coders, the source code is not documentation. So any experienced people in the audience, please humbly take that as a suggestion. Thank you. Mailing list etiquette. Um, even the most IRC-centric project generally does have exchanges that happen on email, in part because it's a lot easier to parse what's going on. Um, maybe it's an age thing, but I find IRC a little hard to slice and dice sometimes. Um, go through, read the old mailing list. Um, some basic things once you're ready to dive in and start participating on the mailing list. Rehashing old things. You want to uh, so, rehashing old discussions is bad for a number of reasons, not the least of which is sometimes old discussions were pretty contentious for a group of people and a decision was made to go one way and not the other, and those who would have preferred to go this direction may still feel a bit miffed. So if you come in and you're like, hey, remember that debate you had back in 1995 about how instead of fixing, you know, creating a new version control system like Subversion, you should just fix CVS? Well, I know you want to work on this new subversion thing, but I think you should just fix CVS. So here's how you should fix CVS. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a, a source code revision control system. It'll be very exciting to you, maybe not right now. <laughs> but the point is, there, this was literally a conversation that happened in the subversion project. Their mission statement was to provide a compelling replacement for CVS. And yet somebody came along and said, you know, I know you guys talked about that and I read everything you talked about, but I don't really think you got it. Obviously, you just didn't really understand that what you really need to do is fix CVS. Yeah. As you can imagine, that person wasn't necessarily totally popular, maybe for some fairly obvious reasons. Yeah. Don't uh, be that person. <clears throat> never. Um, there's a couple of just housekeeping things, some of which are um, kind of legacies from when we all got charged per electron from our internet provider. Um, only reply to the relevant text in a previous message and cut out the extraneous thing. Nothing's more, well, many things actually are more irritating than getting, you know, the entire thread over again at the bottom of the next message. Um, it's not world hunger, but it is annoying, so um, try not to uh, just send out random chunks of irrelevant text. Um, top posting, again, goes back to old-time mail clients. Um, some people still consider it rude to put your reply above the message as opposed to below. Um, that's kind of a cultural thing within projects, and it also depends on your mail client. I currently use a BlackBerry when I'm traveling, and the darn thing will not let me do anything but top post. So don't um, blame anybody for doing it, but it's a nice thing to avoid doing. Um, me Too posts. It's great that you're enthusiastic, but if somebody says X and somebody else says, yeah, X plus plus, and you chime in and go, me too, it's kind of a waste of electricity. Yeah. And actually, I think that that's a cultural thing that folks who are new to free and open source um, are not used to. And that is the concept that typically silence equals consent, or silence equals I agree with you. Because everyone figures if you have an objection or you have an alternate opinion, you'll offer it. But otherwise, you don't want to fill everyone's inbox with, yeah, me too, yeah, me too, yeah, me too. Because everyone would just be reading the same cheerleading mail all day, and no one would ever get anything done. And no filibustering. That's the idea that basically you have an argument, people disagree with you, so you just keep talking, thinking that you will wear them down. Big waste of space kind of makes you look insane. Try not to do that. And, and then, you know, also then you just get the reputation for being that unpleasant person who never shuts up, and it, it's not a reputation you want. Silly nicknames. The internet is no longer an obscure place for hobbyists. So 
when you're going for a job, say, in the IT industry, people will use <clears throat> a search engine and look up your name. And if you are hoping for uh, professional development related to your activity with the project, using a nickname like Mr. McStudmuffin. These is are real nicknames. Not really going to reflect well on you in a professional context. So when you choose IRC handles or email addresses, um, I certainly understand the desire to perhaps somewhat cloak your day-to-day -day name, but think like a grown-up and choose something benign. Yeah. Just a tip. Uh, call me crazy. I don't feel comfortable with the idea of, e of hiring someone or working closely with someone whose email address is Mr. Deviant Dude. Which, actually, he's out there. I hope you're not in the audience. Yes. Because if you are, we'll talk to you. We'll have an intervention about your email address. We are here to help. Yes. Related to that, um, again, with the idea of building up professional credibility and a reputation within the community, it's a good idea to associate your nicknames, handles, email addresses in such a way that they are similar enough that people can tell it's you. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure you were done. So um, for those of us, again, who are not completely familiar with internet culture, using capital letters in written communication is considered shouting. So if you would not want to actually be perceived as standing in someone's living room, standing over them, yelling in their face about your point, please write out your email or your messages or, or whatever it is that you're writing in actual proper grammar, full length sentences, etc. For those of us who have gotten used to text speak or used to using Twitter, so you have to shorten everything to you are instead of Y-O-U-R, which makes the English major in me cringe, by the way, I just want you all to know. Um, doing that in an email message is considered the height of rudeness. If you can't take the time to write out your thought to me in a complete sentence, I don't have the time to give you a well-reasoned response. You need to show me up front that you're respecting my time, and I will happily, therefore, respect your time and your need for knowledge. I will say there are some communities, um, off the top of my head, I'd say primarily in the gaming world, where it is that community's convention to use text speak, et cetera. If that is the way things are done in the group of people that you're integrating into, then by all means do that, but be aware that that is uh, a peculiarity of that particular project and keep it in mind when communicating outside its little walled garden. And as we were talking about before, observing the present, this is where observation is key. Do you see this group of people replying to messages at the top? Do you see this group of people shortening things and, and using text speak? Do you see people uh, using lots and lots of punctuation instead of you know writing very well written, well crafted grammatical sentences? If you do, you're okay. If you don't, don't do it. And you actually have to take a look to know what's going on. I had a situation. Everybody heard of Martha Stewart? I see some, some people nodding in the audience. I had occasion to interact with somebody who's pretty senior in that organization. And I was really pulled up short to get this email that was all in text speak. And it was just like, how bizarre. But this does not apparently that's how they do that there. Wow. <laughs> Ooh. It no. didn't make me trust them with my towel purchase, let me tell you. Just yeah. saying. So um, this slide is obviously directed at the experienced, but we're going to spin it in such a way that you understand it from your perspective. Um, the internet has a reputation for being a rough and tumble place. It is less so now than it once was. Sometimes people who've been around for a while take the unfortunate but very human attitude that people were mean to me when I started, ergo, it is the right thing to do to be mean to newcomers. I would urge you um, old timers to get over that because yeah, it's not productive. And for people who are new, um, please remember that even things that seem really harsh um, generally aren't meant to be as harsh as they sound, except for the obviously deranged people, and you can just ignore them. Yeah. So, and, and again, talking about uh, differences in culture that people may not be used to. It is considered one of the highest compliments in the open source world to actually give criticism and give feedback, with the understanding that 
I have taken the time to give you this criticism and to give you this feedback because I know that you can take what you have produced and make it better. And I have confidence in your ability to contribute to my community, which is high, actually high praise. And I think that generally speaking, we're sort of socialized to think that if someone says that we've done something wrong, that we should go sort of crawl away with our tail between our legs and, and not turn up again uh, because, you know, really no one likes to, to be the one who, standing in the corner who made the mistake. Disavow yourself of that. Uh, if you get, say, for example, if you submit a patch and it's filled with, this is a white space error, you've got a buffer overrun here, I don't like what you've done here, this is ugly, clean it up, and someone hits send to you and doesn't say, thank you, this looks good, or wow, I really appreciate that you took the time to give this to us. That's all kind of implicit in their message, and you as newbie could point out later after you've fixed all those problems, it would have been really awesome if you said thank you for my patch. And someone's probably gonna go, oh dude, I didn't even think about that, I'm really sorry. And I saw a hand in the center. Good advice. Remove a motion from your email. Yeah. Thank you. Other things to avoid. Believe it or not, this gets very happy and positive later. We promise. Um, basic things to avoid. Um, cluelessness. You've lurked, right? So you can kind of tell what's going on in the project. But say you're on IRC and there's, um, we'll say, agitated messages streaming by about something that's broken. This is probably not a good time to leap in with a hi, can somebody tell me how to get started? Uh, it basically, you wouldn't step in the middle of a fist fight or a firefight or something. Just pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, also, um, asking, as we say, read the fine manual questions. Um, this is just something where there's, there's a lot of back and forth because a lot of people feel that um, if you can't go and do a simple search on the internet or if you can't go find it in the documentation, I don't have time to spend with you. And I would argue that that's not really a good response, but it's a response you might receive. And rather than finding out if that's a response you're going to receive, do a little upfront research. Try and get the answer yourself. And again, if you have tried to do that research yourself, tell people about it. Say, you know, I checked the documentation for this particular problem and I can't find it. I pasted this error message into my favorite search engine of choice and all the articles I got didn't solve my problem. If you actually show that you've taken the time and that you're not just failing to read the fine manual, you'll get the help you want. Hostility and non-cooperation is kind of a sadly for, uh, frequent issue. Um, some people just like to fight. And the internet provides them with a whole global community of people to fight with. Um, please don't be that person. Um, we've talked earlier about asking for help appropriately, but there are also people who just come online spoiling for a fight. Don't do it. Um, and, and honestly, if you find yourself engaging with one of those people, back away slowly, avoiding all eye contact, and do not be afraid to simply say, I'm sorry, I am no longer going to continue this discussion with you. These people are called trolls. They have a name. They have a category. Their behavior is well known. Yes. Simply do not engage. No trolls for you. You want a pony. Yes. Or as we say on the internet, don't feed the energy beast. So awesome. Yeah. Um, those of you who are excited about the concept of don't feed the energy beast, we have a great story which we'll tell you later. Okay. And um, if you find yourself starting to participate in a community and um, you get a lot of this hostility bleh, back, um, maybe it's not the right project. Just because you've started getting involved in a project doesn't mean you have to stay there. If you're not enjoying the experience, for heaven's sakes, I mean, you can go and hit yourself in the head with a hammer and not have to buy all that expensive equipment. So if you're not having fun, find another project. And we want to make it very clear that we do not advocate hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Now that we've told you all the horrible things that people are going to do and wow. say to you. Do not be scared. 
you could hang out with a huge group of really awesome people who are actually all very, very nice. Um, this is a picture from our very first, I want to say, Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit. We invited two people from all the projects participating in the program to come and hang out at our corporate HQ and solve problems and think big thoughts together. Um, I, I will point to my dear friend Ollie in the audience who uh, has now looked up and is wondering why I've mentioned him. He was just at our last mentor summit, so he too can attest to the fact that it's a pretty cool place to be. And actually, there are some of your friends that you may or may not know, but you will know soon uh, from the uh, Australian and, and New Zealand free software communities, like there's Siggy from the Silver Stripe Project right in the front row. They're out and, in the uh, auditorium. Yeah, I mean, these are actually people, I mean, you see them, they're smiling, they do not have claws, there are no fangs. This is actually a really great group of folks to hang out with and do great work with, as long as you're a bit familiar with the culture up front and sort of know how to put your foot into the pool. So, in summary, it's always uncomfortable to be the newbie in the room, but everybody was new once. So cut yourself a little slack and do your homework and you'll be fine. And when the next new person comes along and is feeling uncomfortable being the new person in the room, go and be their buddy. Help them get over the hurdles that you yourself faced. Remember that you do have skills. You do have important things to contribute. And also, don't be afraid to ask for help is knowing what you don't know is important too. And above all, enjoy. This is actually a very, very fun community. This is a fun set of problems to solve. This is a bunch of really, really cool stuff that actually is integral to the future of technology. And technology is, is shaping all of our lives in new and different ways every day. And you can contribute to that conversation. And I think that that's a tremendous opportunity that it's easy to uh, that that whole concept is easy to ignore or it gets lost in the noise of, oh my gosh, here's this new tool, here's this new thing, da, 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 da. This is really about shaping the future and you have the chance to do that. So we hope that you'll join us. And some mostly light reading, <laughs> additional resources to help you get started. There's a gentleman named Eric Raymond who wrote a fairly pivotal book which is available online but also in the dead tree form called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And he also, I believe it's only online, How to Ask Questions the Smart Way. Very handy reference. A lot of the um, old school projects that we've referred to um, really live and die by the concepts presented in How to Ask Questions the Smart Way. Um, that being said, for those of us who are part of the newer, softer, gentler crowd of free software, um, I, uh, if you actually are part of a project who really truly believes that you must always ask questions the smart way, you might want to start considering thinking about um, the fact that any question can be asked the smart way, but you might have to help people get there. And again, with a no flaming. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, some really background stuff. The Free Software Foundation has what they call the free software definition. Very handy to look through just as a baseline because you'll run across the concepts laid out uh, frequently as you go forward through this journey. And I think one of the, the really exciting things as well about reading through the free software definition is it really gives you an idea of the social underpinnings and the re social reasons for uh, free and open source software existing and why there are a bunch of folks who think that it is really, really important to share their source code and invite you to contribute to their community. And I think actually having an understanding of the social implications is just as important as having an understanding of the technical implications. So I really urge folks to read that. And last, but very much not least, Carl Fogel wrote a book called Producing Open Source Software. Um, you can get it at no cost online. And even if you aren't interested in creating a software project, personally, having read through it, I think it's a fairly wonderful book on how to organize a new business. So if anybody's interested in starting a project unrelated to open source software, I would recommend it as a good thing to go through. And for those of you who are brand new to open source, while it is written as a manual for folks who are familiar uh, with open source, it's also really great for newbies because it goes through and explains things like what is a patch, what is version control, why is it important, and it explains those things because Carl is making the point in the, his book that it's very important that you explain the importance of these things to new contributors. So as a would-be new contributor, 
that explanation is laid out for you in this work. Thank you all for coming. I hope this has been interesting and educational. And Elsie? That's all. Thank you. Um, we're taking questions now, and, and we need to give this away. Yes, So it's somebody very ask a question, quick. Yes, sir. Oh, that's come not a on. question. <laughs> that's a gimme. <laughs> um, thank you, fail, try again. That was an example of a flame, just so we know. Yes? That was a question. <laughs> it got me there. <laughs> this is an example of underspecifying a problem and failing to get the result that you want. We will try again. Does anyone have a question related to open source for new contributors, mentoring in open source communities, or something other than just give me the darn book? This gentleman, yes? That is an excellent question. Thank you. You can totally have the book. <laughs> yeah. You can come to our booth and totally get stickers and a notebook. <laughs> um, IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. Uh, basically, it's an open line, kind of like a party line. Anybody here besides me old enough to remember party lines? Ah, thank goodness. Okay. Leslie, would you care to uh, describe IRC? IRC is a wonderful place where you can get together with 500 to more of your closest friends and share links to lolcat photos because that's really how to get work done. Yeah. It... I'm serious. <laughs> so the idea with IRC is you join a chat room. Um, you've probably used many other different types of chatting clients and you go into a room with various assorted people and there's a topic. So the topic in a particular IRC channel is usually um, Sometimes there's a developer's channel for a project and then a separate channel for user or newbie questions. So you log on, and there are great tutorials on the internet about how to use an IRC client. There are even web-based internet relay chat clients, so you don't need to know anything about IRC. You just have to go to a website and tell it where you want to go. Like, I would like to join room, you know, hashtag. It's the typical way that, uh, this is the way room's names start. Hash uh, GSOC for the Summer of Code channel. And you start, you know, you can just start talking. I would like to discuss this problem. I have this question. And really, it's, a lot of it is a social thing. People just like to kind of hang out and talk to each other. Um, although, when you want to get real work done, that's the same place you do it because it's a real-time collaborative medium for folks. Uh, this goes back to, again, that whole thing about lurking and observing. You may spend most of your time in an IRC channel, and everyone is really just saying, like, here's an awesome picture of my kid. Here is my cat, you know, crawling up a tree, and by the way, or, or they say nothing at all. It's just dead quiet all the time. And then all of a sudden when you go in there one day and there's a flurry of activity and it's completely different than normal, yeah, that's when you don't talk. You just sit back and listen, see what's going on. Um, related to that, lol cat. Everybody know what lol cats are? They are funny pictures of cats doing interesting things like leaning out of your ceiling and stealing your cheeseburger. Yeah. There's exciting. a whole culture on the internet of posting funny pictures of cats with little made up captions with bad punctuation. Believe it or not, it actually is entertaining. I know it doesn't sound like it. We've just managed to make lol cats sound boring. We're talented. Yay it's, us. It's a skill. Mad skills. Next question. Yes, sir. Interesting. Did everybody hear that? Um, one is don't waste time asking if you can ask a question on IRC. Just ask the question. And the other is be prepared to keep the IRC channel open for even hours 
because um, it may take a while for someone who is prepared to answer the question to log on. Anything else? Yes, sir. I agree with you completely. So Julian's point is that when you submit, for example, you submit your first patch and uh, you get back a fairly uh, critical but not in the bad way response, like this is wrong, 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 please fix it. Um, which is completely and totally understandable if you're brand new at something, you'll make a lot of mistakes. And actually, I think one of the most interesting points that I've heard this week at LCA, because the talks are awesome, uh, Nicole and Mark's talk on the DreamWidth project, and they actually specifically made the point that newbies suffer disproportionately from making mistakes in their first few patches, and that the, the amount of energy uh, that's lost, because if you come back with a completely like super critical response to every problem, when there are some things that are easy to fix, like white space errors, you as the developer could take the five minutes to fix the white space errors and then go back to the new person and say, this is now acceptable, but I fixed these problems. Here are the style guidelines. Please make sure you don't do that in the future is huge. Um, they just did a quick back of napkin calculation on we fix this problem for you versus we tell you to go away and fix it. The people who stuck around were the people who you fixed it for them and then asked them not to do it again. So fair point. Yeah, and there is a big difference between saying, um, your patch is not done correctly and saying you're a moron, eat yeah. glass and die. Yeah. So. And, uh, and if, by the way, if you get told you are a moron, eat glass and die, do not spend your free time working on their free software. Go someplace else. They can have all the glass for themselves. You don't want to be a selfish individual. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. Please go out and enjoy the stands. And, um, and we have really groovy notebooks at our booth at Open Day, which was an example of marketing that is not to make you vomit. Yes. And you should go and take them so that we don't have to schlep them back to California. And stickers. Did we mention the stickers? No schlepping. Reduce our carbon footprint. Take some swag. Thank you. Thank you. you.